and also Olivier, who's right up front here. Um, they're going to be talking about, Christian's going to talk about Orango DB, and Olivier is going to talk about uh, modular JavaScript, but a bit more, I think, about the Unix philosophy and like how you can apply that to your to your JavaScript applications. Um, I guess some first announcements. We are here at Assembly, so we can thank them for the space for giving it up. Um, also thank uh, Petrofeed and Village Brewery for supplying the beer. And um, you can find all of our stuff up online at yycjs.com. Just search yycjs, you'll find all of our stuff up on GitHub, YouTube. We put all this stuff live so that you can go back and watch it if you need to, uh, or if you've missed previous sessions and want to catch up, you can do that as well. Um, what sort of events do we have coming up? We still have uh, Traction Conf coming up on June 18th in Vancouver. Um, some of the biggest, I'm not, I can't even remember all the names. We got basically people from growth from marketing. You got the CEO of Meerkat. You got uh, people from. Uh, the CEO of Plenty of Fish is going to be there. There's who, which was a local Calgary company started here, that he uh, bootstrapped to the largest dating site in the world. Um, there's there's a whole list. It's kind of the who's who of growth stuff. So if you're looking to launch a product um, or looking to learn on how to get customer traction, that's a good place to go and check out. Um, I don't know what else do we have coming up. We have the hat. When is that? On Friday, right? And tickets are 50 bucks. So we've got the City of Calgary Hackathon coming up on Friday this weekend. Uh, tickets are 50 bucks. There's a five, $1,500 cash prize. Um, what else do we have? I think so. Every hack, every Tuesday, we've got a hack night. Uh, we're the third Tuesday of every month, but there's the Ruby hack night, which is the second one. And then the Sheet Geek. And then I think the Python group actually has another one. Um, so those are the other events that are going on the remainder of the month and starting next month. And I think that's enough. So without further ado, pass it on to Christian. Thank you. So I've been uh, playing with this new database, ArangoDB. Um, started playing with it a couple of months ago and started to like it more and more. So I figured I'd tell you all about it, um, everything I learned so far. Um, so ArangoDB is about... Uh, three years old, just by comparison. Uh, MongoDB is, I think, six years old, so twice, twice the age. Um, it's open source, developed on GitHub. Um, there is a company in Germany that backs it commercially, and they are doing a really nice job of monitoring Stack Overflow for unanswered questions and answering them, so that's really nice. They're open, friendly, so it's a great group. Um, uh, the, the, What's really interesting about ArangoDB is that it's multi-model. Um, that means um, you can use it as a key value database similar to Redis. Um, you can use it as a document database like MongoDB. And you can also use it like a, a, as a graph database similar to uh, Neo4j. Um, you can mix and mix these models all together and use them at the same time. Uh, you don't need to mess around with the configuration of the database, restart it or anything. It just, just works. So this is, uh, I find this really interesting when starting out with a new project and you do not really have a clear idea yet of what is the best way to represent your persistent data. So you, you know, just use this multi-model database and it allows you to pick different models, which is cool. And then, um, you know, once you're ready to deploy this to production and want to scale it up, covers you as well, because uh, clustering is built in, sharding is built in. So um, yeah, un unless um, you know, you're starting a project and you're already sure it's going to be at Twitter scale and you need geo-distributed clustering, I would say RangoDB is just a generally a good choice for new projects. Um, so this is not really uh, much of a presentation. It's more of a demonstration. Um, you can find plenty of presentations on orangodb.com if you click on community. Um, scroll a little bit down. There are recent talks and videos. Um, so I don't want to duplicate any of these. Um, we'll give a quick start demonstration, something that I would have liked when I started out a couple of months ago. 
Um, so first step, installing this thing. Um, there are actually lots of packages available, um, like for Windows, Mac, all kinds of Linux distros, um, Docker images, and so on. Every time a new version comes out, those packages are updated right away. They are doing a really nice job doing this. Um, so I'm on a Mac. I assume lots of you are as well. And I think the best uh, best way to go ahead on the Mac is using Homebrew. So you would do like a brew update and then brew install or Rango DB, and that takes a couple of minutes, and I've done that already. Um, once it's done, it prints out the path to uh, the uh, database binary that you need to start up to get this thing running, which in my case is at this location. All righty, it's up. Um, OK, um, a RangoDB comes with a graphical user interface for administration and other fun things. Um, so that is at port um, 8529 on localhost, in my case. Um, the, the main page is just some, some statistics that are interesting once you're in production, not so much once you're uh, in development. So um, what we want to do is um, create a new database. There is a system database by default. So let's just create a new one, YYCJS, and select it so it becomes our default database for this user interface. And then let me start out showing you how to use, um, use it as a document-oriented database. Um, so most of you are probably familiar with relational databases where you have records and they're grouped in tables. So here we have documents and they are grouped in collections. So let's create a, by the way, this user interface is much nicer if the resolution is a little bit bigger. Um, so let's go to collections, create a collection, people perhaps. Um, if you want to do it for a graph database, you can say that the um, collection is a, a collection of edges. I will get into that later. And advanced is um, the interesting, I can't even scroll, uh, properties. You can say whether it should yeah. sync right away or not. Okay. Jobs. Okay, let's create a couple of test documents. Um, you can specify the primary key of this document if you want to, or leave a blank to so let uh, RangoDB pick one for you, which is what I'm doing here. So the, the, uh, the primary key is this number here. Let's add some key values. Okay. And another one. Oops. OK. So we have two collections. One of them has a couple of documents. So let me show you how to use this from Node.js. Um, there is an NPM package called Arango.js, which includes the uh, driver to connect to the database. It works in Node, and you can also use it in the browser. So we would install it with npm install. And then Node. So, yeah. I've got a quick question. Does it have uh, native C++ or C bindings? Or is it just a JS driver? This is a JS driver, but there are drivers for all kinds of other languages as well. Okay, but it's not like Mongo where it, where. It, yeah, well, the 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 MongoDB driver has like a JS fallback, but tries to use C plus plus. So I was just wondering if it if it uh, tries to install like a native a native driver under the. No, it actually it uses uh, it's pure JavaScript and okay. it's using the HTTP API interface of the uh, database. Oh, okay. To cool. talk to it. So uh, since we're talking about it, they're on the download page on the drivers. Uh, you know, PHP, uh, Java, Scala, Ruby, and so on. It's all covered. 
Okay, okay. So um, okay. So let's make a connection to the database. Yes. Um, if the database is running on a different host, different port, you would uh, specify this as well. So what? It's documents from the database. Yeah, I think you just type in document instead of database. Oh, OK. That's silly. OK. OK, whatever. Imagine that's a database. All right, so here we have a connection. So now let's say um, DB. Oh, just let me also quickly define a generic callback method so I don't have to type quite as much. Um, Pardon? Oh. Um, okay. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Cool. So I have uh, console arrow. Uh, okay. So um, database collections callback, for example. Jesus. Okay. So um, gives us back an uh, an array with um, two documents describing both of our collections. So we have our people collection and our job collection here. Um, let's connect to one of those collections. So um, DB collection and then you specify the name of it followed by a callback um, with the collection let's assume there's no error and let me just say um, collection dot um, what do you want to do here count for example callback so that returns an object with a key count. So we have two documents in there. Um, okay, so there's, you know, there are methods for all sorts of database operations. Um, but eventually, you will have to use AQL. So if you're, you're probably familiar with SQL, so AQL is very, very similar to that. Um, so let me specify an AQL query here um, for person and people return person. So that will be a query for returning all the people. And then we say db dot query our query and callback um, returns a cursor. And then you can say hey cursor um, what is it all I think for a little sheet sheet here. <laughs> Um, yeah, all. Okay, so here we have uh, Jimmy and Sarah. Um, okay, let's make the query a little bit more interesting. Um, so in the relational database in SQL where you would use where, in Arango you use filter. So person.age greater than 40, for example, and then run that query again. And we only get back Jimmy. Okay, so that gives you a quick idea how that works. Uh, back to the user interface. There is uh, a page in that user interface for playing around with AQL. So a little AQL editor. So I basically have the same query here. And you can run it and see the results. And really, it looks much more useful on a little bit bigger screen. Pardon? If you zoom out on a browser, like reduce your uh, your percentage, maybe it'll correct. Mm. Like do command minus. Yeah. Well, that yeah, that looks better. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we can um, store queries here, and then they would show up on this tab, so you can reuse them later on. Okay. Um, 
What makes a RangoDB interesting to us, JavaScripters, is that it has the V8 JavaScript runtime built in. Um, and um, a way to um, use it is the Arango shell. So Arango shell, and you have to specify the database name you want to connect to. Yeah, so dash dash server database, YYCJS is the name of our database. Okay, so it's like a JavaScript REPL, REPL and um, we have a connection to the database data already there. So, um, so this JavaScript runtime runs in the same process as the database. So there's not any communication over her, overhead between JavaScript and the database. And RangoDB is trying to keep um, as much data as possible in memory, so it's super fast. Um, and that's why um, this API in this um, JavaScript environment is mostly synchronous. So you don't really, you don't have to deal with callbacks. Um, so um, db underscore collections, for example, is um, showing us all the collections that we have access to. So we have um, people, jobs, and all the ones that start with underscore, those are internal collections. Um, db. Um, so DB followed by the name of the collection, and then you can do like um, to array to get all the documents. So we have our two documents here. Um, we can create new documents with save or insert. Um, so you, you may have noticed there's underscore key, which is this primary key. And then there's also underscore ID, which is the name of the collection followed by this primary key. So this can be useful in cases where you have relationships from one, collection, from one document to another and you don't want to specify up front in which collection that target document is. Um, so in that case, you would use underscore ID as foreign key, basically. So in, instead of saying DB people document, give me this um, document, you can also say DB underscore document and then provide the underscore ID. Um, good. Um, we can update documents. So the first argument would be the, uh, the primary key. Can you also use the ID? Yes, I think so. What's red? Oh. Um, so um, it's a revision. Um, so um, when you update doc implementation detail, I haven't had any use uh, case for accessing that myself. Um, so let's give this guy some hobbies. Do you know actually how long it keeps the revisions around for? Does it get garbage collected immediate, immediately or is it like kept around for a while until you, you run out of... I believe, it, I believe it gets garbage collected right away but I don't know for sure. Okay. Okay, um, another very interesting property of ArangoDB is that it supports joins. So in other document-oriented databases, where you, once you get to the point where you don't throw everything into this one document, but you start to normalize your data a little bit, putting them into different documents and different collections, what you typically have to do, you, you, know, you fetch your main document and then it has a foreign key to a document uh, and you may have to make your second round trip to the database to get that second document. And in RangoDB, you can get both documents in one round trip by using joins. Um, let me demonstrate that real quick. So we don't have any jobs yet. Yeah, 
Okay, so we have two jobs. Um, let's update Sarah. Okay, where's Sarah here? Okay. Let's say she is a software developer. Quotes would help. Okay. <coughs> so here's our <coughs> foreign key. And now to use this, um, db underscore query for p and people, for j and jobs. Filter p dot. Uh, what did I use here? Uh, job equals j dot underscore key. Return. Let's return a new object here. Names p name and salary is j dot salary. And that returns a cursor, so we say to array again. Okay, so it's an inner join. Only one of our people has a job. And there's our new object. Um, another way of returning this data is using one of the uh, many built-in functions, um, merge. So you want to merge the person with this other doc, uh, um, hash here and say, um, Job is J. So we have our full uh, person document here with the uh, full job document embedded and just in one round trip. So obviously, you can do the same using uh, a Rango uh, JS, the, uh, the driver from, from the browser or whatever. Um, okay, so talked a lot, a lot about documents. Let me show you how um, let me show you real quick how um, you would use graphs and because I'm a slow typer, I'm just doing going to do some copy pasting here real quick. So uh, graph functionality is in a separate package that you want to require. It's called the uh, general dash graph. Um, Okay, what I want to do here is I have this file, data JSON, and it has two arrays, characters, with you know, a whole bunch of names, and we specify the primary keys for these characters and additional information. And then it has a second array called uh, connections, which means, hey, a character with this primary key is connected to a character with that primary key, and there's additional values with that. So I want to import this file quickly show you how that works. Um, so we create a, a new collection called characters, so we can store those. Um, we're going to um, specify a relationship from the collection char characters to this collection characters, and we call it nose. Um, we stick this relation uh, in, in an uh, edge definition, and create the underlying edge collection in the database. Um, so here it is. It's called nose. It's from characters to characters. OK, then we import the data. Um, there's another package that comes with the Arango DB for a file system, IO, called FS. Um, let's load our file, our JSON file. I'm just not going to bother doing any clean JSON uh, decoding here. Um, OK, um, importing. Just in the interest of time. So um, for each character here, we're going to say DB characters, insert. Insert is the same as save um, the character. So DB characters. To array. Here we have all our characters. They all have a name, and we specified the primary key. Okay. Um, let's 
So, and then we import the connections. So again, this JSON data for each connection, you're gonna say DB knows that's our uh, collection of edges and we insert. And in this case, there's a, um, there's a special parameters. So the first one is the, uh, the, the primary key of the first collection and then followed by the primary key of this target uh, document and followed by an optional by optional uh, data that you want to store with each uh, relationship. So, <coughs> okay, and here is, um, so here are our nose um, relationships. Um, so it's kind of similar to how you would do it in a relational database, um, a joint table uh, that has meaning as well. So they would have their own primary key and then they have uh, two foreign keys and additional properties. Okay, um, now let's do some graphing with this stuff. Um, so we specify a graph on this, um, uh, on these edges and um, let's pick a random character. So that's Listoyer and then let's ask the graph for all, all the neighbors of this one character. So it, uh, yeah, so it's, that's the list of documents that are connected to this, to our document. Um, there are a whole bunch of other functions built in, graph functions, for example, um, you give it two documents and it shows you the, uh, it calculates the shortest path between these two documents. Um, and you can specify your own. You know, this is all JavaScript, sorry, go ahead. I have so many questions. This is pretty awesome, actually. Um, I guess one simple question is, does it handle auto-incrementing of IDs? Or do you have yes, to Yes, it do automatically it? assigns IDs if you don't specify one, yeah. Yeah, but does it do, um, like in a traditional SQL DB, where it'll auto-increment IDs? Or does it do more of like the hash style? Um, or if you wanted to have auto incrementing I, or like incremental IDs, yeah. do you have to do that yourself? Um, yes. Okay. And I mean, they, they look kind of like the increment. Yeah, but know? they're not. But um, you know, they. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to ask is for the graph queries, mm -hmm. is it a similar syntax to querying, or do you have to use all the built-in? Do they? provide all these built-in functions that you just use for graph? Yeah, they are built-in functions, and you can specify your own. So, um, you know, because JavaScript is built-in, you can specify your own graph functions, and they are basically running at the same speed as the built-in ones because, you know, the JavaScript runtime is in the same process, and the, the data is all on memory, so traversing a graph is very fast. Cool. Um, so, um, um, this is just the V8 runtime, though. This is not full-blown Node. Um, so in Node adds lots of other things, like the, uh, the event loop, um, <coughs> file I.O., network I.O., cryptography, and other functionality. But they do have um, NPM uh, built in. So you can, as you've already seen, require NPM packages, as long as they don't depend on anything Node-y. Um, so, for example, var um, underscore, if you like, underscore, 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 give me a random number between 4 and 30. So, simple packages like that work, yes? So, a question. I don't know if you're familiar with CouchDB, which is actually kind of the same than mm -hmm. In CouchDB, you can create transitive views, you know, like using map, JavaScript map in the future. Mm -hmm. I know it works like to HTTP request. And I was thinking, like, can we use this V8 as some kind of you know, service? Yes, I will get to that. Okay, cool. Yeah, 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 just give me one minute. Um, in fact, that's exactly my next topic here. So um, JavaScript is built in, a web server is built in, as you know, you've seen from this user interface here. So they've taken this and um, added uh, that additional feature, uh, a, a JavaScript framework for making it easy to implement your own API services running in that database. And it's called Fox, F-O-X-X. -X. 
And let me quickly show you how to get started with that. Um, I, I, th I, th I think they just started out with um, basically the idea of using JavaScript for stored procedures. <coughs> and, uh, and then it just grew from there. And you said, right, that's three years, three years old? Yeah. At the time, that was only two years old. So um, you go to Applications, and you add an application. Um, you give it a mount point. So stupid demo application here for stock trading. Um, so let's say the mount point is trades. Um, I'm the author. Name is trades, description, blah, license, MIT. Um, oh, that might be tricky. Um, OK. Um, we can specify collections here that we would like this wizard to create for us for this application. So. Um, Stocks and another collection traits. Um, so we can generate our own applications, or we can also import applications locally from the file system out of GitHub. Or there's a Fox application um, store by the uh, guys from ArangoDB, and it has several demo applications, but also some useful ones that you may want to include in your own API or microservice for, um, so for example, for um, authentication, for um, uh, uh, persistent sessions, and if you have user objects, you can just import this mini application. Um, so let's go ahead and generate our own. Um, um, so this generated our two um, collections, stocks and trades. Let me add a little bit of test data here. All righty, so we have two documents in our stocks collection. Going back to the application, um, this basic application is an API service now that um, has an endpoint for getting all stocks, for creating a new stock, reading a stock, and so on, and basically CRUD for stocks and for trades for the uh, collections. Um, and there's some default documentation in here, and we can try it out. So this is the uh, URI that we would use to get all the stocks, and there's our response. So uh, I have this here as well. Um, so, so you have this uh, you know, port number where the uh, database is running at. In development, you have to use underscore DB, followed by the application name, followed by the uh, controller name, I think. No, uh, sorry. Database name, application name, controller name, and then the uh, API method. Yeah, and there's our JSON response. Um, okay. Um, and then, if this all looks good, you click on set dev to write what you have to your local file system as a little JavaScript project, so you can add your own custom functionality, and I'm almost done. <laughs> you can add your own custom functionality to it. Um, so um, this is the location it wrote this uh, project to. Quickly show you how this looks like. If I initially started up a Rango D with a special parameter um, where it should locate Fox applications, find my old Fox applications, save new Fox applications, it wouldn't be this funny location here. Okay, so I generated some controllers for each collection. Here's one. Um, so there's some setup. Pardon? I was going to ask if it has validation support, and it looks like it even yes. does. It's yes. using Joy for it. Exactly. So here, for example, is the get method for getting all stocks. Um, the URI, um, it returns JSON. 
it uses this repository object to get all records, um, instantiates them as models, and then asks these models to hey, give me just the data that I want to expose to my API users. Um, and uh, so the model, yeah, so that's what I was going to mention next. So it's using joy. Optionally, you can specify your schema here with validation, default values, et cetera. And um, so, you know, once you're a little bit ahead in, in development and your schema solidified and you want to actually validate that the documents that are being created through your API or all comply with that, you can just specify it here and automatically validates it for you, which is pretty cool. So let me just take the last minute to quickly show you what I've been using uh, Fox 4 and Arango DB for. So um, WDT.io, it stands for watchdogtimer.io. Um, the, the idea here is that um, you have some server somewhere uh, with an important uh, cron job. Um, so like this one here, running every hour on the hour, some important task. and you know, you add it to the cron tab and you test it and it looks good and then you forget about it and a couple months later it breaks and you're not going to find out about it until you need that backup that gets created by this, for example. So, uh, so we want to monitor this and that's what uh, I'm creating watch.timer.io for. So the idea is you go to a timer, so, um, uh, you create a new timer, some cron job, and it gives you a unique URL actually two, one is descriptive, the other one is more cryptic. And then what you're doing in your cron job here is, as long as my task is truthy, I also want to curl this address. So every hour it curls at this address, watchdogtime.io is uh, keeping an eye on it. We configured it that it expects basically a ping at this address every hour, and it's okay if it's two minutes late. And once it stops doing that, watchdog time, I will send you an email saying, hey, alert, you have to fix whatever is broken in production. Can you do webhooks too? Pardon? Right. Like, well, I guess it's a future feature, I guess, a webhook URL that you get called, like, instead of sending an email? Um, possibly in the future, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm also thinking of adding, like, pingdom like functionality, but, yeah. Okay, that's it. Thanks for your attention. So I actually have a couple questions too in, in terms of, um, I guess, how have you found working with all those different data structures? Have you, have you co-mingled them a bit or do you find that you're only using one type of data structure? At like this document? point, I'm only using documents. Yeah. And I was going to ask too about uh, like performance. Do you do you have an idea of like how performance is um, with Arango, and then even in terms of how disk space is and stuff like that? Like how do the documents grow? Or um, I haven't really run it in production yet, so I don't have any practical experience with it. Um, the Arango team is blogging on a regular basis, and they've been posting benchmarks that look pretty promising. Cool. Thanks. Re really appreciate it. That was good. Cool. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Is there any difference between using document storage in performance-wise or the category or the size of actually or the size of actually? Difference between edges and? Documents and edges. So, so edges are really underlying just, docu uh, just documents. Okay. Yeah. So, so they are stored the same way. So no performance difference, really. Anybody else? So uh, I use the LangoDB. I found that the Arango the join is very, very, very good. Mm -hmm. LangoDB missing that. Except that, what else? Like uh, is uh, LangoDB is better than LangoDB? Well, the built-in JavaScript runtime I find really attractive. I think so, that, so that, that graph accept, support, yeah. that graph support too, is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. The fact that you have that flexibility, I mean, uh, there's a bunch of really cool stuff there. I think that, um, I mean, the generation of services is pretty cool. It'd be interesting to see what that's like 
um, in practice taking that a bit further or like how much you, if you just use it as a scaffolding tool and then do a lot of heavy modification or if you can actually generate like more complex services. Real time proxy. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Okay. Okay, break time. Good stuff. Okay, we're going to get started again because there's a hockey game on later and it's nice out still. And it's dark in here. Okay, Olivier is going to talk about the Unix philosophy. <clears throat> Take yeah. it away. So, okay, so I think I should start by the the last. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I woke up this morning. I totally forgot that I had to do this presentation. So I guess it should it, it's going to be short. It's going to be short, and I, I want to watch the game anyway. Um, so initially we wanted to talk about modularity, but uh, we thought that would be more relevant to talk about the reasons why we should do things modular, right? Um, and talk about the Unix philosophy, which is something pretty tight to uh, Node.js in the web community, NPM and stuff. So yeah, my name is Olivier, I'm French. So don't hesitate if you don't understand me, if you have any questions. Okay, so the Unix philosophy, um, I think it's born with that guy called Ken Thompson. And basically, it's, it's not methods, it's more like uh, conceptual rules that will help you to build simple system with clean interfaces. So I'm not, I'm not talking uh, intentionally about operating system because I think it's really relevant to, to JavaScript. And so during this presentation, I will talk about some of the rules that apply really well to to JS. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm a hater, and <laughs> I don't like those frameworks like Polymer, Angular, Ember, and all those shitty things we have in the web community. Hopefully, I will explain why. <laughs> uh, the Unix philosophy became kind of my uh, new Bible, and it helps me to understand why I don't don't use those. Pardon my French. I'm not going to say bad things about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> rule of uh, like I said, there's many rules. So I'm just going to go through some of them. Um, I thought that the rule of simplicity was really relevant. Uh, as developers, we 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 are kind of proud, you know, to do to do things complicated, right? To juggle with abstraction and even like to have some kind of contest with our coworkers to say, oh, can you read my code? No, it means I'm smart. And uh, <laughs> it'll always lead to a code that is hard to maintain. And, um, and like I said, everybody at the end lose because we have complex code that nobody can read, nobody can change, nobody can update. So the rule of simplicity in the Unix philosophy push you to create simple code, what they call like simple and beautiful. And so I think something like, like stupid is a stupid does, that's for us Gump, right? Yeah. Some of the command line tools we're using are like 30 years old. Like they haven't changed in 25 years. Just yeah, I, I remember like that guy, I, I don't remember his name, he invented Erlang and he said like the mistakes we did 50 years ago always give jobs today and the government should, you know, thank us. <laughs> so <laughs> I, that guy is so smart. So anyway, do stupid programs. Um, something that kind of is kind of the same than the rule of simplicity is actually the rule of clarity. So everything is not about documenting your code, and which, which is great. If you document your code, that's great. But you have to create a code that is um, maintainable that somebody can read. You do your code like for humans and not for machines, right? So yeah, create a, a code that is graceful and clear is better than uh, creating complex code. So I didn't tell you the company I work for and I want 
because I'm going to give some examples I saw <laughs> the last few weeks in, in, our, in our code, right? Uh, that's about rule of simplicity, rule of clarity. I saw that thing, and I was talking to that guy, and he said, this is more readable. And I, I don't know if, <laughs> if you agree with him, but I think, well, he, I think he's an idiot, and he doesn't know JavaScript because basically he could just return idiot and it would do, it would do the same thing, right? Or not, not. Or not, not. That's too bad we don't see. Do command minus should work. Command what? Command minus. Minus. Command minus. Okay. How you do it? Do you see that? So to keep to keep going in the hater theme, um, I saw a lot of people programming JavaScript as they as they do in Java, but still they don't know Java, and it makes me really really mad. <laughs> and something I saw is that like they're gonna they're gonna well except the boolean in Java, there's not much things that are truthy or falsy, so you always start uh, you always. <clears throat> test if something is undefined or whatever. I saw that thing many times where we're going to test that the argument is not undefined, that it's not false, or that it's not zero. And I'm you know, trying to say, well, you're just testing that it's not falsy, and everything that is not false in JavaScript is truthy. And it's part, I guess, to make uh, something that is um, <clears throat> readable and, and maintainable. Okay, uh, so I actually um, show those examples because I personally have some rules, and maybe one which is uh, be stupid. Like in JavaScript, especially, it is good to not make any assumptions about what the code is going to be, right? To not make assumption about the future of the code. Uh, that's also like the refactoring rule, the do not repeat rule, right? Something I apply to myself is. I, I try to not make functions that are more like than 15 lines of code because it means that maybe they, they do one more they do more than one thing, which is bad in JavaScript. Uh, something I had to, to hear as well is people talking about premature op optimization when it's more about incremental refactoring. So um, there's this, actually this rule in Unix, which is the rule of optimization, that says first do the job, then optimize. Uh, I agree with it, though I think in JavaScript it's good to incrementally refactor the code, right? Uh, when you do unit testing, test-driven development, that's part of the methodology. Write the code that just sends some our tests, create a new test, and then refactor the code. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, the rule of least surprises. So yeah, basically, it's don't do anything. Um, try to <coughs> create functions or objects without any side effects. Something that you know, well, where you don't have any surprise, right? Uh, I have not much to say about about this one. The rule of representation. So that's actually good that we. We had that um, great presentation about our MongoDB because data is kind of um, <clears throat> something central in JavaScript, especially when we do some front end, right? Everything is, ca is kind of related to, to the content. And <clears throat> I really think that, um, um, that the, the logic should be more in the data than it is uh, you know, JavaScript data should be really simple and to have a, some kind of clean separation of um, responsibilities. It's good to kind of choose a side. My side, my side is uh, the data. Uh, those guys created feathers. That is, uh, that is awesome. That allows you to <clears throat> kind of abstract multiple transport layers uh, server side. I created a, a simple uh, project called Data Store, which um, <clears throat> wrap mo uh, the concept of model and collections in the front end. It actually works in the in the back end as well, and that's also why I said 
this in red, which is actually really, really bad, I think. Uh, some people say that model, the concept of model in MVC should be, should be at the heart of your application. And that's not true at all. Um, when you create applications, I, I believe that the, <clears throat> the data of your um, multiple components should be as simple as possible. And if you have to tra transform the data, then it should be in a separate uh, application component or even server side with uh, feathers. So MVC sucks. That's something I, I really, I believe. I actually, MVC has some frameworks like the one I showed at the beginning exposed. Uh, why it sucks? Because at the end, I think we have a lot of spaghetti code. Like I said, many complex things you know, you know, in the M of the MVC. Uh, in JavaScript, it's quite impossible to have a clean separation of concerns. You know, when you have like a a template a templating engine, you will still have some kind of logic in it. And yeah, complicated models and collections. That's so, I, something I, I don't understand, honestly, like why we have collections of models. Uh, for me, it kind of makes things more complicated when, again, rule of simplicity, we should do so, things that are simple. <clears throat> so, so that's not actually MVC that sucks. I guess that's what the, the developer do with it. Um, MVC is, a, is an architect architectural pattern, but it doesn't mean we have to create application just based on that pattern, and that's something I see too much. Everything is MVC, and <clears throat> I guess a good example would be, let's say we have uh, two, um, two controllers with like that separate views. Let's say there's a login and there is a user UI. They, they both share the same model. That's something we, you would do with MVC, right? Well, if the model change, your controllers and your views maybe are going to break. And um, this relation to parent, parent to children are OK in uh, OOP, right? But JavaScript is not just about objects. For me, that's really like Java. That's a Java-ish pattern to build everything on top of objects, right? And when you have A, and inside A, you have B, C, and inside B, you have D, E. If D breaks, your entire, your entire application basically breaks as well. So for me, that's not really a good thing. <clears throat> there's some, uh, there's actually no name for it, but there's some um, architectural um, frameworks that, that exist uh, that gonna, um, I don't remember the name in Java for that thing, but basically it's create scalable and maintainable application by creating self-contained components that are all at the same level and communicate through a, a bus. And this bus is usually text messages. I'm talking about text messages because <clears throat> in, in the Unix philosophy, everything is about text streams. Isn't the component model exactly what Polymer is trying to do? No. So Polymer like oh, invents oh, those, oh, you're talking about services? In, in Angular? Oh, you're talking about Polymer? Yeah, web components. No, Polymer do web components. Yeah. That's actually something that for me sucks as well because uh, I, I like the concept of custom elements, web components where you have like self-contained JavaScript and CSS inside HTML will kind of push you to, um, we will increase the fragmentation in the web community, which is already something really bad. You know what I mean? We you have a web component that has jQuery and an underscore, and then you have another web component that has Lodash and Zipto. Well, you have like all those libraries that does the same thing, but you don't care, right? I just I'm just going to use that component, that component. The Unix philosophy push you actually to do the opposite. Um, <clears throat> just to get back to to that, um, we can talk about it. To to get back to that slides, there's uh, some frameworks. <clears throat> that uh, kind of put things, everything at the same level. So for example, if you have to build Gmail with this application, instead of having, well, Gmail and instead incoming messages, and instead incoming messages having chat, you have chat, incoming messages, 
uh, spam, whatever, all at the same level. It means that if um, <coughs> chat breaks, it won't break your application. It has to mean that chat is something you can reuse uh, outside of your Gmail application. And that is that is actually really great. <coughs> and that's really uh, a rule that I'm going to say uh, after the rule of composition and modularity. Um, I actually did a, a, a framework like this called Wall, which is a uh, um, front-end side framework that looks exactly like Express.js. So Express.js is something that is awesome and that not a lot of people know, and it's called SubApps. So now they talk about microservice, microservices. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. But SubApps is really cool because basically it's well, you're going to split your entire application into multiple sub application with path and so the world does that and applies some uh, uh, some kind of event emitter on top of those sub application this way they can communicate between each other <coughs> and that's actually some composition because they all have the same uh, as a standardized uh, interface which is just an event emitter so basically you send text you get whatever you want Sorry, I Go ahead. didn't get that in the previous slide. Flatting your architecture. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Um, so I actually tried. <laughs> um, how can I explain that? I think the Gmail application. Maybe try and repeat that. Yeah. So if you have to build, let's say, Gmail with just MVC, you would create a, a parent element. And inside that parent, you will, in, you will instantiate um, a sidekick. You will instantiate incoming messages. And inside the object incoming messages, you will instantiate, um, I don't know, editor. And inside editor, you will instantiate which text panel, whatever. So you have like this kind of inheritance, right, that is proper to object-oriented programming. That kind of makes sense, but if rage text editor breaks, then uh, incoming messages message breaks, and then incoming messages breaks, and your entire big, uh, entire application is broken. So you say incoming messages not dependent on the rich text editor. And what I'm saying is that think your your application has a bunch of sub application modules that are totally self contained, independent, mm -hmm. and put them at the same level. And, and some of them need to communicate, right? So you can use text streams, you can use event emitters, you can use whatever you want. Something good with that pattern when you, instead of having like this any returns, you put everything at the same level is that you can have multiple versions of the same applica uh, sub application that runs at the same time. It can break, it won't break the entire application. <coughs> and you can namespace those messages. Uh, most important, and that's actually maybe a good comparison with Gmail. Gmail has this chat application, right? And this chat application you have it you have in Google Plus. You have it in in Google Documents. And so you can see that as like a separate self-contained micro application that they, they they reuse, you know, in in multiple projects. Yeah, I agree it's kind of a component wise design. But I didn't see that it can see uh, better than uh, we see uh, architecture. So this, this are a little bit uh, confusing to me because MVC is more uh, granular because like in the, each component you should you have to separate the concern about the model view controller. Uh, what I'm saying is don't use MVC. That's why I said developers suck. <laughs> I mean that's mean. Uh, I think you MVC if you if you do it well is actually uh, really useful, right? But everything should not be based and built around just MVC. There is some other patterns uh, other than MVC. There is decorators, there is facades, there is whatever the, the pattern you want to use. You have a, a set of tools and everything is not about MVC. You look at Backbone, Ampersand, Ember, Angular, even Polymer, and all the actually all the frameworks are there. Uh, some of them will be more like libraries. That's actually why I, I, I kind of like React. 
but some some will push you to do the angular way they will push you to do the ember way and for me that, that's not something like really uh, reusable and in long term not maintainable technology change there's always like cycles right and everything should be should be made or maintainable is the word for me I can show you later like some some examples uh, do, 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 rule of composition so yeah so the Unix philosophy push you to create interfaces with uh, clean well create software with clean interfaces and most of the time uh, especially in, in Unix we use uh, text streams because that's that's universal and yeah comp composable software is actually independent um, software and at least the the rule of modularity so everything about Unix is do one thing do it well we have now in JavaScript the tools to do it using common JS using uh, AMD using uh, JavaScript harmony now and um, <clears throat> Too much, and for me, Node.js became this um, huge jQuery thing because we have like there's what a hundred thousand packages now, even more on npm, and it became this oh that's server side so yeah I'm going to use whatever I I want because anyway there will be no extra weight for for the user. Um, and there's so many packages that don't respect that philosophy now. Everything, uh, like, what is his name? Isaac? Isaac for N uh, NPM and for Node, it is, I think that's Isaac as well. Yeah, him and Mike. I don't remember. I think that's something, uh, anyway. They, I, I, I'm like 90% sure that they, you know, they push you to, to that philosophy for Node and for NPM. And something that a uh, bunch of guys said, like uh, Substack, and we love that guy, um, do one thing, do it well. And that's something that we really proper to the Unix philosophy. We can create modules that do just one thing that are easy to test, that are easy to debug, that are easy to maintain. And uh, <clears throat> something good as well with JavaScript, it, something that a module doesn't have to be an object. I don't see why if you expose just a addition method, you have to uh, return an object with that method in it. You can just like return that function. Um, <clears throat> something that we did multiple presentation for in the last meetups about functional testing. And functional testing is something really interesting, which is no side effects. And that's something I would like to see more in, in JavaScript, actually, especially with, with modules. Uh, yeah, some of the rules, there, there is a lot. The rule of separation, uh, parsimony, generation, uh, the optimization one. Um, they apply as well to, to JavaScript, but I won't go into uh, details. Um, you go on Google, you tap Unix philosophy, you will have a complete document about what is Unix. Uh, we, they will start with the Unix philosophy. They will talk about C. And yeah. So grab a B if you have any questions. So I do, I've got one question. Um, Shoot. And we've worked before together, and so my one of my complaint, not so much a complaint, but struggle with having a bunch of really small modules is um, just how to keep track of them all. Yeah. Do you have any any tips for how to keep track of um, managing, you know, potentially dozens or or maybe even in a large application, fifty or hundreds of modules? <clears throat> So I worked mainly on GitHub. Um, there's some best practices, of course, which is which are like 
to give versions, right, to, to your dependencies. I don't think when you create a, an application, you, you will finish yourself by developing a thousands of uh, components. Uh, the thing is that maybe you're gonna use a, a module that's gonna use another one, that's gonna use another one. In the open source community, I guess one of the rules is trust yourself and trust the guy that developed the module using, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, of, yeah, I think that's, that's something that, I don't, I don't think that's an issue. Um, for sure, it, 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 it asks like some kind of, um, how can I say that? Overhead. No, it's, it's not an overhead. Because even when we worked together, right, we didn't have that much dependencies. But you have to be, uh, I've lost my name. Yeah, exactly. That was the word I was looking for. You have to, to get some. Um, and yeah, I think I'm actually going to sort of answer my own question too, <laughs> in terms of along that line of discipline. And like, now that I think about it, the times where I've had a bunch of really small modules that do one thing, sure, there may be a bunch to manage. So sometimes yeah. I'll be in a scenario where I'm developing a module locally that I want to use, or maybe a bunch of modules that are small that I want to use, and I'm developing on them as I'm potentially using them. <clears throat> But maybe that's not actually the right way to go about it because really you should be defining, uh, creating a well-defined interface, writing your tests for it, and then using the module yeah. because you have there's, tests that prove that functionality. There's a, a lot of benefits of using modules that I didn't talk about. Um, so I was talking about fragmentation, right? And that's something I don't like. I don't, for example, I don't like to use a library when I don't understand what it is doing, and I won't, uh, when I don't read the code. And something I hate is uh, doing something simple, but finish, um, I'll, you know, you finish up by having like jQuery underscore and maybe a uh, Angular. And in all those libraries, well, there's, a, there's duplicate code, right? Uh, well, all of them do, for example, uh, some looping. And they have event emitters, right? They have those kind of things. When you use modules, May, you're going to use uh, most of the time an ecosystem of modules, right? Um, <clears throat> especially using uh, using Node uh, and some some um, some tools like Prozorify, Duo, Webpack, whatever. Um, you can have you you let's say for example I was talking about uh, Brick, which is a MV star library I did, and it used like a bunch of, it's all based on modules. So it used a uh, data store. Data, that's the data store used event emitter. Brick itself used event emitter so that I don't have any extra rates because yeah, I, I use an event emitter, right? I use data store server side. And Brick, for example, is two kilobytes. Does the same thing than, uh, than an Angular, a backbone, whatever, without having the 100 kilobytes JZIP of the, those frameworks. Uh, I was talking about wall. Wall use data store. Your wall use event emitter. I did another project that do virtual DOM and virtual diff. They use they use data store. They use event emitter. And when I combine everything, <clears throat> I have four kilobytes. And everything I need. I a router, some models, some views, whatever. All the all the shit you need to create applications. Uh, you were talking uh, as well about testing. <clears throat> when you reduce the complexity of your code into self-contained modules that do one thing, they are easier to test. And especially in enterprise, something we forget a lot of the time is testing our code. And when we have like, when we start having like <clears throat> feedbacks from our clients, that's when the, the hell starts, right? So testing is actually really simple with modules. Uh, what else? Yeah, for example, I can show, so now it's not, I changed the name, it's not component.js, it's duo. But you have that community where there's 2,000, 3,000 uh, modules. That goes, well, actually everything, everything you need. Um, <clears throat> and if you don't find the module that you need, you just develop it. And, and that, that's it, right? Um, what else? So yeah, you were talking about underscore. 
So yeah, I, I prefer Lodash, and I, I heard that Lodash now you have like separate modules like for every yeah. every method, which is awesome, right? Because if I just want to do some uh, zip things, I don't need like a huge library. I can use just use one method, and it's done. That's also something I, I like is you architecture your code. You just use do it. Do, do one thing. You do it well. You need to do it to do one thing. You just do use exactly what you need. <clears throat> and now uh, <coughs> JavaScript is uh, powerful enough. We have. Uh, on GitHub or in, in the community that do, do a lot of stuff for, for JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a, a lot of um, a lot of talk uh, talk now about jQuery is dead. That's uh, something like in the company I work for that just about jQuery, 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 jQuery. So abstraction is good, but it's also something really bad when you don't understand how it how it's working underneath, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know what time it is. Seven forty. We have twenty minutes. Does anybody have any questions? So, if you just design architecture with a small component, how do you manage all the dependencies? Yeah. NPM. Yeah, I'm still using like, well, for for JavaScript now and Common JS, it would be NPM. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. If, uh, for example, you have uh, you obviously depend on component A and B. Yeah. A and B also depend on component C. Yeah. If component C in, uh, have a new release version jump, not backward compatible, B jump with the C. Well, something something great, for example, with um, NPM that Power doesn't do, it's um, how they call that. Yeah, yeah but they, they call that the hierarchical, hierarchical, hierarchical <laughs> resolution, whatever. But in everything you will have, if you use A, A and B, and A use C1, and B use C2, you will have two Cs. Yeah. Like for whatever the, the Un unless you well then there's there's D so that's where peer dependencies kind of came in, and then you've got deduplication. There's a tap you can actually run npm dedupe, and that'll remove yeah duplicate dependencies. But basically, like. I mean, that's what semantic versioning is for, is to yeah. prevent you from updating a package and just getting something that isn't backwards and compatible. And even with rights, you can, something that's not good, but you can just use the star thing, and <laughs> you will yeah. be sure that yeah. you have the last the yeah, latest version. Yeah, it's it just, just, that's not something good. But you made a good point, though. I mean, like in the open source community, there's sort of implicit trust, right? Yeah. That people are doing Something semantic versioning what, properly yeah. and that they are not releasing broken intentionally broken uh, backwards compatible APIs and something so. we did multiple times is let's say you use a dependency and the guy doesn't maintain it or you need another version you can yeah. still guilty you no know, fork it <laughs> whatever and do yeah if you fork like all my projects I'm gonna come back Mike you had a question No, I was just going to say, like, you know, you can still be, like, a Unix sort of project that has a bunch of modules. You don't necessarily have to have, like, a separate sort of GitHub as well. You can use every module, you know, like, that's in libraries. You can build them all internally or whatever, and it's all kind of the same library. So you can deploy each one of those and it's held in the Right. So you don't have, like, 19 GitHub things to go check that out. Yeah. Exactly. That's Perfect. I'm going to, because nobody on the internet caught that, and that's important. Basically, just having one project um, that has its own GitHub repo or remote repository, but having a bunch of the modules that live inside of that. So you don't have to do Git uh, um, pushes all the time whenever you need to do an update. You can actually just use um, semantic versioning and uh, require the modules internally inside that repo. I sympathize with that's how I build my own projects, but I have to acknowledge that my personality oftentimes gets in the way. That this personality where I'm always willing to choose the best. Yeah. So, so the smaller a package, the smaller modules you pick, yeah. you know, the more you need, 
And then if there's choices available, you know, you, I oftentimes follow the analysis paralysis. So I, I'm also using React. And then I spent several days researching Flux libraries. Which one is the best uh, Flux library? Yeah. <laughs> if, if I would have just gone with Angular or with Ember, they would have made all these decisions for me. You know, I may have disagreed with half of them. But my, my project would probably go <laughs> further ahead because I didn't yeah. have to make all these decisions. That's also why, you know, some. That's a subject I'm really passionate about, which is like maintainability. And um, a year ago, that was a year ago, I, uh, mm -hmm. I gave that presentation about how you should have a holistic approach uh, when you create a project. And then, you know, just, okay, like I think in every company I worked for, for every new project, that was the first question was, which framework should we use? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm like, Phew. And I, I really realized that there's things that are way more important, like how are we going, to, how are we going to maintain our code, how I'm going to work with that guy or with that guy at the same time, and how we're going to uh, write the same code because the most important is to write the same code. It doesn't have to be the best code; it has to be the same, right? How? Oh, if I use Node.js, maybe I want some isomorphic code, whatever. So. And by asking yourself all these questions, sometimes you know you will finish up by having Angular, or you will finish by doing modules and stuff. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, like the presentation, I, I use a lot of bad words just because I don't have a lot of vocabulary. So when I say <laughs> when I say it's shitty, when I say it sucks, I mean I don't really like it. <laughs> So you will forgive it's me for that. It's not my favorite. Um, yeah, I, I like the way that you approach stuff. I mean, I, I'm biased. I mean, but I've worked with a lot of developers, and a compliment to you. I mean, like, honestly, you've been probably one of the best ones I've worked with ever. And because of that uh, simplicity, the fact that you approach stuff with kind of start a project and do a project with no more or no less than what you actually need. But like, like, like you said, I'm the same. Like now I have this thing that sometimes is really annoying is I can't use any libraries without going through the code. And if I see something that I don't like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to write it I'm, myself. I'm going to try to find another one. I'm going to write it myself. And that's a bad thing. Uh, that's a bad thing. I used to grab JavaScript projects with the term class. If they use the term class, they don't understand Yeah. Yeah, the concept of class in JavaScript also makes me sick. Uh, really quick for, for you. So I was talking about war. Um, so there's um, Zakas and Adios Mani that gave some. So Adios Mani is working on every framework out there. <laughs> he, said, he said, though, something that makes me really laugh in a presentation. He said, if I have to choose a framework, uh, I won't finish. Uh, said I would be drunk already and it was like 9 9 a.m. or something so that was I thought that was really funny uh, anyway they, they gave some speech about how to create scalable and maintainable um, application Adios Mani did that thing called uh, Aura JS for for backbone mm -hmm. so I don't know if it exists still let's see I think it does and that actually that was actually the first one and I'm actually surprised that not a lot of people use it's it. It's still one of the better implementations of except like, well, <coughs> except well. <yeah. laughs> but yeah, like uh, Backbone is quite old, so there's but it, they did a lot for for the the web community. But they built that thing, and that's actually quite awesome if you use Backbone. Uh, my framework, so I don't know where it is now. While you pull it up, I'm gonna kind of try and try and simplify maybe. Yeah. Because we please. talked about this before, that essentially kind of what he was talking about with the with MVC and to some extent I'm gonna talk a little bit about this next month when I give a talk on React, because React has a bit of both worlds actually, where you have kind of component composition, which has its benefits, but also its drawbacks in terms of creating a really nested structure can can actually really complicate things. Passing data down a nested structure can be really hard. 
Um, debugging down a, a nested structure can be really hard, and you can have that scenario where a nested component breaks and then breaks the rest of uh, its parents and grandparents, right? At least all the way up the stack. So the concept behind this, um, and this is kind of where Flux has sort of come in a little bit as well, but essentially the idea is basically use events and make your architecture much more flat and self-contained so that your component knows about, it only cares about the things that it should care about in terms of the data. It has a clean uh, interface, typically now, which is an event mechanism. So the nice thing about that is if your component breaks or if it doesn't get the events that it is listening to or with the API or the interface that it's expecting, only that component breaks and not the rest of your application. It all the positive, uh, like the benefits of that are reusability, like he was saying, maintainability, but also the fact that if one component breaks or you have a bug in one component, it doesn't break the rest of your application. So yeah, I, uh, I tried to do um, to do that in the front end with um, so this library called Wall. It's more like actually a framework this time. You know, when I guess Angular and those kind of things are more like libraries. Um, and we'll um, use exactly the same API than Express with kind, of, with kind of the same concepts. But that was more like Express 3. So, you know, when you can configure GIST states to applications. And, and um, create like microservices or sub apps, right? So, you know, I was talking about Gmail. Like, by supposing that we have, we already did a chat application, an authentication application, whatever. Creating the your application would be as simple as doing something like this. That's like when you play Legos, right? You start as something like uh, bricks of the same shapes, of the same colors. You can use bricks of the same colors, of the same shapes, right? You will find the, the talk, the presentation I was talking about. And with wall, so I don't know if I have examples. Something I did is name space those applications. So let's okay. say I could use settings twice, and I give one the name space settings one, and the other one settings two. And those settings applications send messages, and automatically they will be name spaced <coughs> and go, we go through this hub I was talking about. For example, Oath could like intercept those messages and do something with it. So at the end, when you create a sub-application, you expose some kind of API. You say, <clears throat> when I send the message, foo, I expect that. When I get the message bar, I expect that. And this is really convenient, and it makes things really, really easier at the end. I don't... I don't know how to explain that. Um, <clears throat> maybe maybe later in the year we'll get you to to actually come and give uh, a walkthrough demo of building yeah, applications. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it would be interesting. It would be interesting. Uh, Does anybody have any questions before we wrap stuff up? Bueller? No? Okay, awesome. Cool. Well, thank you, Olivier, for presenting. And thanks again, Christian. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for coming out on such a nice sunny day um, to this dark room. We're going to reconvene next month, and like I said, I'm going to give a talk on React. I'll be pushing up the um, the description probably right after this evening. Oh, and Jason is also going to talk about this. He just got voluntold. He, no, hopefully, maybe not next time, but maybe after that, because um, it's actually a really cool dashboard. They have some nice JavaScript technology they want to uh, roll out. So I think it's worth talking about. He next just month? got voluntold. Next month. OK. <laughs> so a little quick plug, if anybody hasn't seen this, this is uh, Momentum. It's a Chrome plugin. Gives you a nice slick dashboard in your uh, new tab. And uh, it's quite popular right now. Okay, we'll see you next month. Thanks.